Hello people, welcome back to this tutorial for beginners in Revit. This is the part 7 and here we will focus on drawing roofs by footprint, putting grids on the project and then we will add columns at the grid intersections. So be ready! In this chapter we are going to learn to draw roofs in Revit. Here we have the same floor plan, but this time it doesn't have the stairs. Imagine it as just a one-story building. We are going to draw the roof here. Let's open an elevation plan and as you can see we should draw the roof on the view plan called level roof. This one, that's important, because if you just try to make the roof on the ground floor view plan, the roof just goes directly to the ground, which is not exactly what we desire. So, I'm going to switch to level roof, and I realize nothing is shown here, even if I zoom in or zoom out the workspace. Basically, if that also happens to you, have a look at the underlay section on the properties window. On the first tab, range base level, I decide here which elements I can view below the current plan. It is set as known. So I click on this tab and switch to ground floor. And now it's better, I can see the floor below. Now we can draw a roof. I'm going to the icon at the architecture tab, click on the arrow below and select the first option, roof by footprint. On the properties, I can choose from several roof families already loaded in Revit. Let's start with the one defined by default. Also, the command roof by footprint opens in the sketch mode, just like floors and stairs. I'm going to choose as my method, draw the boundary, with pick walls. But first, let's look at the options. It's always important. I'm going to check this box, define slope, as I don't want a flat roof. However, not all the walls require a slope, but we will look into that later. Now look at this one that says overhang. It's basically the distance from the roof start point and the wall face. If I set zero, the roof starts exactly at the walls. But in this example, I don't want that. I'm going to define the overhang of, for example, 0.3 meters, which is 30 centimeters. Now I'm going to hover one of the walls with the mouse and you can see the boundary line located at 30 cm from the wall. And if I drag the pointer closer to the internal side, the boundary just switches here. So let's click where I was previously. Then I pick all the external walls, one by one. When I finish drawing the boundary, you can see that all the sides have a slope defined there, because all of them have this symbol and the angle is the one set by default, which is 30 degrees. Click on the tick to confirm the roof, but there is a question here. Would you like to attach the highlighted walls to the roof? I'm going to say no for now. I switch to the 3D plan, and here there is, the roof looking quite nice in this house. Let's select it, and you can see that the walls remain exactly where they were before because I answered no to that question. If I clicked on yes instead, you can see the walls going up to the top. Edit slopes on roofs. Now I'm going to remove this roof and create a new one. This time I don't want slopes in all sides and the angle will also be smaller. Click again on roof by footprint Select just these four sides and to connect the last and first points of the boundary line, I'm going to use this time Extend to Corner. Click on this line and then on the first star I drew. Ok, this is the boundary of this new roof. Now let's select all the lines, but for that I must click on Modify to do it. Then on Properties, I can modify the slope angle if I wish. I'm going to set, let's say, 18 degrees and click on Apply. So all the angles changed. Then I select these two sides 
and remove the slope. I uncheck this box. Click on the green tick to confirm the changes and choose No here. Now look at the 3D view, how the roof looks like. But of course, as you can see, it's necessary another roof in this part. So let's go again to the roof plan. I activate again roof by footprint. Click on these three walls. Then I need to switch to draw a line. I click on this end point and draw it up to this intersection. And to remove the extra part, one of the possible ways is using trim. Select this one as the reference line, then click on the part of the line to trim that I want to erase, which is this side. Now I can modify the slope angle and notice that it will apply to all the sides when no one is selected. Next, I select the sides that I don't need a slope, remove the tick on Define Slope and place the roof. Here again, I'm not going to attach the highlighted walls to the roof for now. Then let's go to the 3D view to have a look of the result. It looks nice, but of course, I need to join both roofs now. And this requires just a simple step. On the Modify tab, there is a specific command to join roofs. Click there. Select an edge at the end of the roof that you wish to join. Click on this one then on the surface of this main roof, and it's done. You can see they are joined, but they are still separate elements, here on Revit. Now, this gap between the external walls and the roof, it's not very nice, I know. So we have to attach them. Attach walls to roofs. I want to attach this wall to the roof above. I select it, Click on Attach Top Base and then select the roof and the wall will extend exactly up there. Then I just do the same for the others, but I can do it by switching to the ground floor view, because it's easier to select several walls here. This below, I leave for after because they will attach to the smaller roof. I click on Attach, then I switch to the 3D view and click on the roof. Charan done. Finally, I just need these two walls and they are going to connect to this little roof here. Now we are going to speak about grids. They are useful for setting a specific position of certain elements in a project. For example, one of the most common is using grids in floor plans for placing columns. In Revit, the way we draw grids is very similar to levels. To draw a grid, we click on its icon at the Architecture tab. Then click anywhere for the first point of the grid, it can be here, and then click again for the second point. And notice that the bubble by default is displayed on the second point. Now it says 2 but I want this identification to be 1. This happened because I already placed a grid before. Click in the number and change to the one that you want. The squares at the extremities of the grid line indicate if we want a bubble or not. If I uncheck that box, the bubble just hides. On the other hand, if I go to this side, I click here to put a second bubble. Then I can continue adding more grid lines and if I move the pointer to this area I can see a tracking line to snap the first point along the same horizontal axis. I can also type a specific length of this temporary dimension that is appearing here. However, if I just want the grid to overlap the wall face, you can click when the distance is zero or in the end point, then drag to the other side and click exactly at this point. As you can see, this bubble is automatically labeled as 2. Now drag the grip down here to put it in line with the previous one. So I place two more vertical grids in this view 
by just repeating the same steps. Great. Now let's start adding horizontal grid lines. Ok, the first one, as I want to overlap this wall face, I can click in this endpoint, as now it's hard to snap to the wall in a different position. Then notice that the grid numbering keeps counting on the same way, as the last was 4, now it says 5. However, we usually don't want to have the same counting system as for the horizontal grid lines. We can have letters here, and the next grid lines will follow an alphabetical order. Now let's put two more grid lines in a horizontal direction. When I finish, I can edit the grid lines as I like. We can do that by clicking and dragging the grips on both sides, and you can see that they come all together. Revit by default puts a constraint on the movement when you place the start and end point along other grid lines, and you can see this lock symbol on both sides. I'm going to click on grid number 2, and if I unlock this grip, we can extend just this line freely. After placing the grid lines, we can easily change their position. If we click on one of them and modify the temporary dimensions, it works just exactly the same way as for the walls. Let's now insert some columns in Revit. You will see that it's very practical to do this here, especially when we use grid lines. I'm going to start with the architectural column, which you can find in the architecture tab. Select the architectural option first. Then we have one family already loaded with three types. Of course, you can find out more families on your libraries, some with more interesting shapes. But in this tutorial, one of these suits perfectly. Let's use this first one. Now we assume the grids have the purpose to place the columns. That's easy, because columns snap automatically to their intersections. So I'm going to place one column at each intersection. Inside the building, of course. And at the end, just press escape twice. At this point, Columns and grids act together. If I decide that they are not placed correctly, I can easily change the grid position. And you can see that the columns always stay in their intersections. Now let's look at the Options tab. Here you can choose the top constraint. At this moment the columns are set to reach the level roof. And they are going up from this floor because this option is set to height. Then, rotate after placement. If I check this option, I place the columns and then set a rotation angle. The option Room Bounding only works when we have room elements in the project. I haven't introduced rooms yet in this tutorial, but I can let you know that when Room Bounding is checked, the columns don't count to the room area. But don't worry, we will get deeper on that later in this course. Let's insert a structural column. As you can see, it works the same way. The main difference is that these columns go down by default from the current plan. This option is set as depth to the top of foundation. We can notice this if we switch to an elevation view. Look, our structural column appearing over here. Due to that reason, we may have a problem on the visibility when we insert a structural column. None of the created elements are visible in the floor plan. Of course, they are going down, and I'm not seeing anything below the ground floor. Do you remember how to solve this? Ok, just exit the command column, and then, on the floor plan properties, Change the range base level to top of foundation wall. Then click on apply and you will be able to view the elements below. Good. Now how can we very quickly add a structural column in each architectural column? On this panel we can add multiple elements. We can place a structural column 
at grid intersections or at the architectural columns. I don't want a column at each grid. So better choose architectural column. Then I select the elements. I can choose one by one or to be quicker, just open the selection window to cover them all. Simple. Then click on the stick to confirm the changes. As a conclusion, this is very intuitive for an engineer that needs to make the structural project using plans from the architecture. It's easy to change the position of the grids or even add or remove columns if necessary. Ok, that's all for now. Thank you very much for watching and don't forget to subscribe to Cad in Black to watch the full list of tutorials for beginners in Revit. There are also AutoCAD tutorials if you are interested. So see you next time!